Okay, so we're in session four. We are over halfway there. We're talking about God and science today in the catechism. We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That God has made me and uh, has given me my body, my reason, all my senses, and all those things. That God is the creator of everything. Uh, but can we look at science and, and believe science, but then also believe what we say in the Apostles' Creed? Uh, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Or to put it another way, can you be secular and also believe in science? We'll see that you know secularism, uh, very often it is uh, biased in the way that it approaches science. Um, I say that because sometimes secular people will say that Christians are biased in the way that they approach science. But, um, so we're going to look at the question of God and science um, let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever seen this movie? Nacho Libre? Yes. It's a good movie. Would you vouch for it? Yeah. It's pretty funny. Not as funny as Napoleon Dynamite, but very funny. Um, I think the same director. So in, Nap in, in uh, Nacho Libre, you've got these uh, two main characters. You've got uh, Nacho, who's played by Jack Black, and he is a monk in Oaxaca, Mexico. And it's his lifelong dream, alongside being a monk in a monastery, is to be a luchador, to be a Mexican pro wrestler. He's got the cool costume, he's got the tights, he's got the cape, and in his other life, he is a professional luchador. He has a sidekick named Esquelito, and Esquelito uh, joins him in the ring as they uh, fight really scary teams like uh, Satan's cavemen. Um, so there's this one scene where um, Nacho is really concerned with how the, the, uh, the fight might turn out because they're going to be wrestling Satan's cavemen. And he's like, I'm kind of concerned for you, Esqueleto, because you haven't been baptized yet. And then Esqueleto says, why do you have to always be judging me? Don't you know I only believe in science? And uh, later in the movie, again, he asserts, why do you got to judge me? I only believe in science. In the same way, a lot of people, a lot of secular people would say, I only believe in science. I only believe in what I can see. I only believe in what can be proved through the five senses. I only believe what science can tell me. Let's try this out a little bit. So agree or disagree, do you think that science can prove that the Grand Canyon is beautiful? Disagree. Why? Yeah, it's kind of a subjective opinion. Now, I would say that the Grand Canyon is beautiful, but there might be some kind of um, negative person who might show up and be like, this is lame, it's just red and orange dirt. I mean, you would hope that if people looked at the Grand Canyon, they would say, wow. But there could be somebody out there who their subjective opinion might be that it is kind of lame, while as other people would say that it's beautiful. Science really can't tell us if something's beautiful or not beautiful. Um, how about this one? Science can prove the date that I was born. Sort of. Sort of. Hmm? Sort of how? Somebody close that door. If you don't mind. I mean, we have a piece of paper in our basement safe that says I was born on May 18th, 2002, but I guess like an actual science experiment could it be done on me to say it. Right, you're not like a tree, you don't have rings. Like we, we wouldn't see like, oh, how old are you? Uh, 15. 15, there's 15 rings. So we know that Braden is 15. We're not gonna try it. Um, but the idea here is that you really, you can't scientifically prove how old somebody is, like to the day, to the date. I have a piece of paper in my basement that says that I was born on May 27th, 1983. But how do I know that maybe there wasn't a typo? Or that my parents were lying? I can't scientifically prove the date of my birth, but do you believe I was born on that date? Do you have any reason to doubt me? No. Okay. Science can prove my parents have been married for 20 years. What are some evidences that you might have that they've been married as long as they've been married? Marriage certificate. <laughs> Marriage certificate, yeah. Maybe some photographs. You might be able to date the type of photograph like, oh, that was a Polaroid picture from the oh. 80s or something. 
<laughs> but you're not able to say the exact date, right? You can't scientifically prove that. You see where I'm going here is that we can't just use science for all of our beliefs. In fact, saying, I only believe in science, is not something you can prove. Yeah. How about this? Science can prove that my five senses are reliable. This is where it gets really fun. What's reliable? Oh, wow, this is getting deep. <laughs> can science prove that the five senses that you use to do science are reliable? In other words, is there a reliable connection between the outside world and the way I experience it? Yes. We all like see and might we all might see and hear the same things, but it's the way we I guess think about what's happening using those senses. So it's not as much the senses itself, it's like our memory and how we perceive it. But can you prove it? Now here's where it gets really messy because the scientific method completely depends upon the presupposition that there's a real world out there and the way that you encounter the world through your five senses is reliable. Now as a Christian, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm like, yeah, the scientific method works because God made a real world and he made us as the kind of people who are able to perceive the world and think about it in rational ways. Um, I mean, the wonderful thing about this universe that makes science possible is that things behave the same way. Like, gravity just always works here. <laughs> um, and uh, light behaves the same way. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, there's consistency in the universe. I mean, things aren't like, well, tomorrow gravity is going to be a little different on Earth. The whole entire scientific method depends upon a universe that's rational and orderly and that functions the same way. Uh, water always boils at the same temperature, freezes at the same temperature. You get where I'm going. But it all presupposes that the five senses are reliable. How about this one? Science can prove that there is no God. What do you think about that? Disagree. Disagree. Okay. How so? Well... Science can't really prove that there's no anything because they can only prove that there are things. There's no way to prove something doesn't exist. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Doesn't God exist outside of our five senses that we use to measure science? Oh, here we go. So, when we do science, we are observing the material physical world. The universe. Is God a part of this universe? <clears throat> God is not a part of this universe. So we have here, we have the universe, all the created stuff, you know, and maybe we're like somewhere right here. Uh, and then we have God. Now, God is separate from the universe. That doesn't mean that he's not involved in the universe, but he's separate. He is not physical. He is not created, and if you're using science to explore created things, can you explore something uncreated and not physical? You, we don't have the, the instrument to measure God because he's outside of the universe. He's not created, and, and so by definition, science can't tell us that there is no God. Um, so don't let anybody tell you that you know, if somebody tells you that, especially if they're in, into science, they're not doing science anymore, they're doing philosophy or theology. Um, oh, well, another thing on that, uh, there's a story I heard about uh, um, the first cosmonaut, the first Russian cosmonaut to go into outer space and, and, and to see outside of our atmosphere, came back, he was an atheist, not surprising because he lived in communist Russia, he said, I went up there and there's no God, no heaven. Sorry, everybody. C.S. Lewis, the uh, former atheist, then Christian writer, said, well, that's kind of like Hamlet going into his attic and complaining that he couldn't find Shakespeare. If, you go into, if Hamlet goes into his attic, should he find the writer of the story? 
Shakespeare doesn't exist because I can't find him. That doesn't make any sense. Now, does Shakespeare leave some traces and evidences of himself in the story? <coughs> yeah, if you're a careful reader, and I think that's the same thing with science, that it leaves us traces of God. Now, can science prove that God exists? <coughs> Well, let's just be fair either way. I don't think science can prove that God doesn't exist. I don't think that science can prove that God does exist because, once again, we have the problem of we don't have the right instruments to measure that kind of thing. But could science give us some clues about the existence or non-existence of God? I mean, what you do with that is really going to depend on your worldview, right? This is why we've talked about worldview so much because... The way that you look at scientific evidence and the philosophical conclusions that you make on the basis of it is really, in large part, going to depend on your worldview. We'll see that uh, later in the class. Uh, we're going to watch a video of Ben Stein interviewing Richard Dawkins, a uh, very prominent atheist, Richard Dawkins. And you'll see that worldview bias come out. So, the first article of the Creed, Creation and Luther's Small Catechism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? Let's just all read it together. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. Now, at the end of each part of the catechism, we always say that famous Lutheran statement, this is most certainly true. But when we look at science, and then we also look at what we say in the Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Can we say this is most certainly true? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. I think we can. We have good reason to say that it makes more sense to believe in God than to not believe in God on the basis of science. So there's three mysteries that I would say that atheism cannot adequately explain. Now remember, when I say atheism, I'm talking about the secular worldview the belief that there is no God. And I think that when we are doing Christian apologetics, we, what, the one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to take the Bible and try to treat it like a science textbook. Like we don't want to take Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and then try to like connect all the dots in terms of the science that we have. Because science is always kind of open-ended. I mean, it's always changing and being adjusted based on knowing more. And also, the, the, the Bible was written before the scientific method was uh, created, and, and so we would be doing injustice, I think, to the intent and the purpose of the text and its writer if we just tried to play connect the dots with the details of the Bible and science. But rather, I think that our better strategy as Christian apologists is to do this, to point out the, the large-scale questions where atheism doesn't give a good answer, but the Christian faith gives a better answer, and I will share with you three of them. Uh, there's this quote by G.K. Chesterton, wonderful author, writing about 100 years ago, and he says, No philosopher denies that a mystery still attaches to the two great transitions. So imagine these transitions as like big hurdles that you have to cross. He says the mysteries are these, the origin of the universe itself and the origin of the principle of of life itself. So the big question that's really hard to answer in purely naturalistic, no God allowed terms is, how did anything even get here? And how did life get here? And then he adds a third. He says, most philosophers have the enlightenment to add that a third mystery attaches to the origin of man himself. In other words, a third bridge was built across a third abyss of the unthinkable when there came into the world that thing we call reason and that we call will. So how do we get from nothing to a universe, and then from a universe with no life in it to the first single cell of life, and then from that to you and me who are able to think about these kinds of questions? How do we get to that? It's a big problem. Not easily resolved. So the three main questions I think that we as apologists should engage in when we talk with our atheist friends in the secular worldview is how did the universe begin how did life begin, and what is consciousness? We could easily spend multiple sessions on each of these, so we're going to really kind of rush today and jam-pack a lot of things in um, because we have a lot to cover. 
We're gonna watch a video real quick. Uh, this is by Eric My Taxes. Eric My Taxes is actually from Connecticut. He's a um, fairly well-known speaker and um, writer. I think he went to Yale, and he's from Danbury, I think. Uh, some of you have seen this video already, so I apologize for the repeat. I think I showed it in confirmation one year. This is really hard to do the opposite way. cover story asking, is God dead? The cover reflected the fact that many people had accepted the cultural narrative that God is obsolete, that as science progresses, there's less need for a God to explain the universe. It turns out, though, that the rumors of God's death were premature. In fact, perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life, the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, Scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis. Nada, zilch, which is to say zero, followed by an infinite number of zeros. What happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were, in fact, far more factors necessary for life, let alone intelligent life, than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, then 20, and then 50, which meant that the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. Even SETI proponents acknowledged the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. For example, without a massive gravity-rich planet like Jupiter nearby to draw away asteroids, Earth would be more like an interstellar dartboard than the verdant orb that it is. Simply put, the odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Can every one of those many parameters have been perfectly met by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? But wait, there's more. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest inconceivable fraction, then no stars could have formed at all. 
Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions, and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads ten quintillion times in a row. I don't think so. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken by these developments. One of the world's most renowned theoretical physicists, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. Even the late Christopher Hitchens, one of atheism's most aggressive proponents, conceded that without question the fine-tuning argument was the most powerful argument of the other side. Oxford University professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. The greatest miracle of all time is the universe. It is the miracle of all miracles, one that inescapably points to something or someone beyond itself. I'm Eric Matak. Okay. Um, so I have a little picture up here on the, on the screen of uh, the, uh, the soundboard we have up in the sanctuary. And you know, look at all these different dials. And let's pretend like, like right now, all the dials are perfect to have like, they're not, are they? <laughs> I'm looking at like, he's like, no, they need some work. Let's pretend like that all the dials are perfect. Um, look at all the different parameters, all the different contingent factors that would contribute to having a perfect sound system. Now, imagine that you decided to just blindfolded, just do all of the different dials on there. Do you think you could get it again? That's kind of what we're talking about with the universe, is that there's all these different um, factors like, you know, electromagnetic force, the strong and weak uh, nuclear force, gravity, that all these things have to be just right in order for the universe to exist as it does and for it to exist in a way that would uh, make life possible. And then within that, you know, our galaxy has to be just right, our solar system has to be just right, our Earth actually depends on the, where it's positioned and even things like asteroids and a large planet way out there like Jupiter. Um, all these different factors. Uh, not only that, Earth has to have the right substance for carbon-based life, you know what I mean? It's just, what are the odds that all of just, just kind of happened? Um, so in the Christian worldview, we're going to say, well, there's intelligence behind this. There's a mind behind this. That God has created the universe um, for his purposes and for his glory. And that's why we're here. We're not just here on accident. By the way, did you know that the, uh, the actual idea of the Big Bang was uh, created by a Roman Catholic priest? The name, uh, I believe Fred Hoyle gave the name the Big Bang, but the actual theory, the idea of like everything, space and time, exploding out of one central point a long, long time ago, that was actually, uh, that comes from a Roman Catholic priest. Um, let's take a look here at our next question. How did life begin? I think this one's a fascinating one. Because once again, we're gonna see the insurmountable odds go along with the question. So back when Darwin wrote The, uh, the Origin of Species, over 150 years ago or so, he believed that time plus chance equals life. So you know, a lot of what Darwin says makes sense, you know, the variation that we see within species and all that, but his big question was, how do we account for life in naturalistic terms? Meaning, no God, that basically, how did life get here just randomly by chance, by known causes? And his thought was that time plus chance equals life. Um, the thing, though, is that, is that Darwin didn't know what we now know about the cell, that the most basic cell is not just like plasma and jelly on the inside like a membrane with goo on the inside. That's kind of the way that Darwin saw the cell. Uh, he didn't know that the cell is more like a city. That the simplest cell is more like a computer, right? There's all kinds of intricate workings within the most basic cell. And not only that, 
He didn't know anything about DNA. You guys have learned about DNA in school, right? What is DNA? Code. Okay. So when you say code, that makes me think of information, right? So DNA is really the information that is used to build life. So what's the instructions for a Pastor John? Well, it's in my DNA, right? That's the way my cells, you know, I have different traits about me that are what they are uh, because it goes back to genetics and DNA. So um, DNA is really interesting and it actually just really complicates things as far as origin of life goes because DNA is biological information. Now, the, um, the old experiment that was referenced in my biology textbook was the old Urian Miller experiment from 1953. I think it was done at the University of Chicago. And the idea here was that they tried to replicate what they thought the early Earth's atmosphere and, and, um, and other conditions would be. And, and um, by applying a multitude of different factors, they tried to see if they could get um, at least what would look like the beginnings of uh, amino acids because amino acids are the building blocks of cells and life. And, and so they, they gave it a shot. And actually, the first results looked kind of promising because they actually did have congeal, you know, in the bottom of the, of the test tube there, some, um, what, the beginning of the, the pieces of the building blocks of, of amino acids. And immediately, everybody kind of jumped on this and said, yeah, this is it, this is it. We found out how life began in kind of a primordial ooze in a warm puddle somewhere. Um, the problem is, is there, well, there's actually a lot of problems with this, and, and it's kind of been discredited. Is it still in your textbooks? Yeah. Because the latest reading I've done on it is that this has really been discredited because there's a lot of problems on it. And so you have some people who would say that, you know, life kind of formed, self-replicated on the back of crystals, you know, kind of like snowflakes make designs that maybe naturally this design of DNA made itself and just kind of arose naturally. There's a ton of problems with that though because the thing with like, with like a, uh, a snowflake is let's say that you have kind of a pattern like this and it just repeats though. Like, okay, fine. You know, crystals do that and, and uh, but what if you have something that's way more complicated like a gigabyte of information and it's encoded information that builds something way more complex than a snowflake that has to work together with intricate parts and systems. That's where it gets kind of complicated. So the same year that the Miller experiment went down, they also had uh, Francis Crick and James Watson discover DNA. James Watson, rather. So here's the thing about DNA. I just want to kind of help you understand this a little bit. So I got my Scrabble game. You guys play Scrabble? Yeah. It's the most exciting family game ever invented. About this much more exciting than Monopoly. Just kidding. Okay. So I've got all these letters in here. Let's say that I pick out a phrase that you might know. I think this one works well with origin of life, to be or not to be. You know where that comes from, right? Not all at once. Shakespeare, right? So to be or not to be. So let's say that I just shake up these letters and I repeatedly just spill them on the ground. I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to have to clean it up. Let's say that repeatedly, like every second, you're just spilling these things on the ground, all these letters. What's the likelihood that maybe in a million years I might get to be or not to be? Do you think it could happen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, it might happen. Like once. Like yeah. once, maybe. If you're lucky. Possible. Like really lucky. Theoretically possible. How is this different than this? That doesn't have punctuation. How is this different than that? It's interpretable. This is interpretable. But if you didn't speak English, let's say you read Chinese, would this make any sense? No. 
This only makes sense because you can plug this, this sequence of letters only makes sense because you can plug it into something called the English language. See, that you, and now if you're paying attention, you'll see how this DNA thing gets really, really, really confusing and really tricky because, so let's say, you know, we just kind of, you know, random forces kind of collide and we get something like DNA. Even if you were to get the smallest strand of DNA randomly at chance, it still has to plug into this whole thing, this whole bigger thing where it works. It's got to be able to self-replicate. Not only does it have to self-replicate, you know, like make more of itself, but also then the, the DNA is going to have to plug into this whole different system where it's able to work and make things like cells. So see what I mean? Like this doesn't make any sense unless it's plugged into the English language. DNA doesn't make any sense unless it's plugged into the bigger framework of, of being able to build things. So maybe in a million years we could get to be or not to be, but do you think that after a million years of doing this, we could get the complete works of Shakespeare? No. Probably not, but that's the kind of information we're dealing with, like, like um, lots and lots and lots and lots of encoded information in DNA. Um, so you get somebody like, um, Bill Gates, who says about DNA that DNA is really just like is is like it's like a computer. It's like it's like computer information. It's, it really functions in a lot of the same ways. Now remember that Darwin was looking for known causes. So if I show up here uh, next Sunday and my speakers are gone, I'm not going to just say, well, maybe the speaker gnomes took it, or maybe it just flash disappeared into another universe. I'm going to say, I bet somebody is borrowing my speakers or they took them, right? I would posit a known cause for the absence of my speakers. Now, Darwin was saying, all right, let's find a known cause for the origin of life. But in the most basic level of life, we have, in, we have information, right? DNA is encoded information, complex encoded information. Here's a question, though. What's the only known cause that we know of that accounts for information. Intelligence, right? The only known cause that we have for, for information is intelligence. So if you go out to the beach and you see, I love you, written out on the beach, you're not going to think, oh, just random forces just happened to beat the inconceivable odds and, and make this uh, sweet message that says, I love you with a heart around it. You're going to say, well, somebody wrote it. Intelligence imposed itself upon matter and made a message that connects into, you know, a bigger English language and all that. So in the same way, um, some origin of life scientists would say that there has to be some kind of intelligence that's behind this, that, that when you look at DNA, there is encoded information there, and the only known cause we have for information is intelligence. Any thoughts or questions? Okay. So I wish we could spend more time talking about the nature and the origin of consciousness because this one, I think, is huge. Um, this is written by an atheist. He says, Consider, for instance, the problem of the origin and nature of consciousness. Remember how G.K. Chesterton in that opening quote said that this is an insurmountable problem? He said... Consider, for instance, the problem of the origin and nature of consciousness, the failure to solve it without resorting to religion or quasi-religious intelligent design, which offers no real resolution since it doesn't explain what created the consciousness behind the intelligence of intelligent design, strikes many observers as dangerous. Dangerous because it threatens the foundation of scientific rationalism and materialism, Dangerous because it disrupts one's sense of any order in the universe and it opens up the floodgates of chaos. It's kind of a lengthy quote there, but basically what he's saying is that the, what does it mean to have a mind and to think, to have a will? How is it that matter basically made out of the same stuff of the dust of the earth, you know? How is that able to consciously think about itself? That's a big perplexing problem. 
And so uh, Rosenbaum is saying this is a problem, and, and, and it, it's such a problem that sometimes people will try to account for the nature and the origin of consciousness by saying, well, maybe God did it. And he says, well, you can't do that because, well, who made the intelligent designer behind the design? But do you see the flawed logic here? If you keep backing up, you get the same problem. An atheist, the secular worldview, and the Christian worldview actually have the same problem. If you keep backing up, you're eventually going to have to admit that there's something that has existed by itself. For the atheist, it's, well, the, there was nothing, and then somehow the universe and all the laws of physics and all the parameters of, of this universe just exploded into existence out of nothing. But if you're a Christian, you just have to admit that there is a God who has always existed and always has been and always will, and that when you get even beyond the nothing, God is there. That kind of just tanks moralistic therapeutic deism, right? So do you see how, how the flaw in logic here and the, and the problem? If you keep backing up, I mean, where did anything come from? You're either going to have to admit that it came from nothing or that it came from God. We don't have time to do this next part. What I was going to do is I was going to have you guys all take a quarter and see if you could get heads ten times in a row. Anybody think they could do that? Probably. After a long time. Yeah. The odds are really small if you're doing the probability. Um, it's really, really small that you get ten heads ten times in a row. But, um, so, let's think about the odds, though, that we're dealing with, um, with the origin of life and the origin of the universe. So this comes from the work of MIT biochemist Robert Sawyer. He says, the probability of achieving a functional sequence of amino acids in several known proteins at random is exceedingly small. So when I'm, ta I'm talking about like building DNA just randomly, like it just happens by itself over a process of millions of years. He said that this is really small, about 10 to the 63rd power. Is that small? One in 10 to the 63rd. To put this in perspective, there are only about 10 to the 65 atoms in our galaxy. You see what kind of odds we're dealing with? Uh, Stephen P. Meyer in his book, The Signature in the Cell, says the, the odds of getting even one functional protein of modest <coughs> length by chance from a prebiotic soup, think back to the Miller experiment, it is not better than one chance in 10 to the 164th. The complexity of the events that origin of life researchers need to explain exceeds the probabilistic resources of the entire universe. That's the issue here. So not only are you able to get just randomly this encoded information in DNA, but then is it able to self-replicate itself and be plugged into this whole structure of of, um, of building and, and, and creating cells, and, and then you have to get into the complexity of, of organs and systems, and, and then the human mind and consciousness, it just kind of blows your mind. That is actually why the secular worldview has had to come up with some um, alternate ideas. So anybody ever heard of multiverse theory? That there's an infinite amount of universes? So the idea is, because the odds are so incredibly almost zero small that the universe would exist as it does and that it would be hospitable to life, some people in the secular worldview have said, well, maybe there's an infinite amount of universes. And so if you roll a dice an infinite amount of times, you're at least once going to get this. Now, the problem with this is that if there's no way to prove that there's other universes because you can't get out of your universe to observe another universe. So really, this is just, it's just a, a guess. And I wonder, why is this any less or any more reasonable than God? Why would somebody be biased against believing in God? Like, you can't believe in God, but you can believe in multiverse theory. Or the idea of Francis Crick, I believe it was Francis Crick, one of the two who, who uh, discovered DNA, he recognized the problem of the information in DNA, and he said, look, this is a problem. Maybe it was seeded here by extraterrestrial life. 
the idea was that maybe it was planted here, or maybe it floated in on an asteroid or something, or, or planted by aliens or something. Maybe that is a possibility. But then you get an even bigger problem of, well, where did that life come from? You just keep pushing the problem back and back and back and back. And I would be really embarrassed to tell somebody that I believe in alien life, planting life here. I would not be embarrassed to tell somebody I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, because I believe that it's credible. We're going to watch a video now, and, and um, this is from a movie called um, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. It's talking about kind of a bias within the scientific community sometimes to to not want to think about the possibility of God. And, and it really does a good job of interviewing a lot of different scientists from different disciplines about why they believe that we cannot account for the universe and life apart from intelligence, from God, namely. And uh, you guys know Ben Stein. He's a little bit before your time. Ferris Bueller, seen the movie, Mary, in the 80s, before you guys were around. But, um, so we're going to watch this uh, video quick. This is and what I want you to do as as you're watching the video. Um, how do I get rid of this? As you're watching the video, I want you to um, notice the bias that Richard Dawkins has. Richard Dawkins is a prominent atheist, and he's being interviewed by Ben Stein. And notice how worldview plays into the opinions that Dawkins has about science. Let's see if this pulls up here. Watching online, just go check the YouTube video out. I'll send you the link. Professor Dawkins seemed so convinced that God doesn't exist that I wondered if he would be willing to put a number on it. Well, it's hard to put a figure on it, but but I I, I mean I put it as something like you know. Mm -hmm. 99% against or something. Well, how do you know it's 99% against, say, in 1997? No, I did, you asked me to put a figure on it, and I, it, I'm not comfortable putting a figure on it. I think it's, I, I just think it's very unlikely. What? But you couldn't put a number on it? No, of course not. So it, it would be, be 49%? Well, I, it would be, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's unlikely, but, but I, but, and it's quite far from 50%. How do you know? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I put an argument in the book. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it might start it. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in Darwin well, evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, that is a possibility and an and intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some 
explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. <laughs> so the, the Hebrew God, the God of the Old Testament, he doesn't exist in your view? Um, certainly. I mean, that would be a, a very unpleasant pro prospect. And uh, the trend, Holy Trinity of the no, New Testament, nothing, that doesn't Nothing exist. like that. Do you believe in any of the uh, Hindu gods? Like Vishnu? How can you ask such a question? You don't, how, right? how could I? I mean, you why, why would I, given that I don't believe in any others? You don't believe in the Muslim god? No. I mean, why do you even need to ask? Well, I just wanted to be sure. So you don't believe in any god anywhere? Any god anywhere would be completely incompatible with, 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 with anything that I've said in, in I, I, I'm just trying to... Okay, so let's kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, I think <clears throat> comments or thoughts. Like, how do you see worldview impacting the way that science is interpreted? Because remember, that, that's why I've been taking you guys all the way through all these worldview questions before we get to evidences, because I want you to see that the lenses we wear are going to affect the way that we see evidence. Yeah? Because he was saying that we could have come about on intelligent life, but it just couldn't be God. It had to be something else. Yeah, he was admitting that like, you could see a signature. Like, and, and incidentally, there's a book written by Stephen P. Meyer called The Signature in the Cell. And it's about DNA and, and intelligent design, that the information is, is, in a way, kind of like the creator's signature, that we can see this evidence of intelligence at the basic level of DNA. But, and, and Dawkins acknowledges that, but he says, oh, but it couldn't have been God. It could be some kind of explicable intelligence. But once again, that backs up the problem of, well, how did life get here? He says it couldn't have just jumped into existence, but that's what the secular worldview believes about how the universe got here. Yeah. Um, it kind of seemed as the interview went on, and as he was more and more challenged, he was just kind of trying to, what's a good word, like, I guess push away at anything. Like, he started going on, like, this has nothing to do with anything. This is incompatible with everything. Like, he started using a lot of general terms, and, like, he was trying to refute anything at that point. That was really interesting at the end. I mean, Ben Stein's being kind of funny, obviously. He's like, so you don't believe in this God. You don't believe in that God. And eventually he pressed Dawkins to the point where he said, that would be completely incompatible with everything I've already said. So he wasn't talking about whether you can prove that there is no God. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, well, there is no God because that would be incompatible with what I already believe. Did you catch that? See how worldview is impacting the way that science is interpreted. That's why if you go back to session one, remember uh, those two scientists, you got Richard Dawkins, and then you've got uh, a really brilliant scientist as well by the name of um, uh, Francis Collins, who both equally smart people, but one believes in God and one doesn't. See, very often this is a heart issue. It's an issue of what we'd gain or what we'd lose if we had to admit that God exists. Not really an issue of whether you're smart or not. Anything else you notice from the video? I can think of one more thing. So in the beginning, in the beginning of the video, um, Dawkins actually admits that you can't prove that there's no God, which I think is interesting. And then he tries to put a number on it. He says, well, I'm 99% sure. I mean, but, and, and then Stein's like, well, why not 49%? There's, he, he's just basically making assertions that have no basis in reality. Um, so I just want you guys, as you're studying science, always study science confidently as a Christian, because as you'll read in the article I'll send you, uh, there's an article, two articles I'll send you, but one of them I'll send you this week is it talks about how very often we talk about the, the war between faith and science. It's really kind of a conjured myth. that if you look at many people are Christian and they're scientists, and many people in the history of the scientific method were Christians. In fact, the scientific method developed upon the, the soil of Christian Europe. The idea was that if God created an orderly universe for his glory, it's worth checking out and learning about it and using the world on the basis of the way that God created it. 
it assumes that there is an orderliness to the world that we are able then to discover. So Johannes Kepler was a Lutheran. You guys know about Kepler, right? He was in with uh, Copernicus and, and the whole understanding of the way that our solar system works. Kepler was a Lutheran, and he said that science is thinking God's thoughts after him. Because if you're a scientist and you discover something new, you're the second person to think about it. Because God was the first. So always take that curiosity, take that, that, that confidence into your science classes, and also take it into further scientific research. Because some of you might go on to, to do science at the undergraduate, graduate, or maybe doctoral level someday. So, cool. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Next week, we're going to talk about I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We'll talk about how do we know what we know about Jesus. See you then.